Humans have made a tremendous impact on our environment. We all know about global warming, the spread of plastics and concrete particles and radioactive isotopes across every continent. But with evidence all around us of a human-changed planet, those changes have been changing us too. This is a talk about how the world we made is remaking us. The big changes to our habits we might see as when we first turned to industry or began to gather in large cities or even when we began farming. But the really strange thing about the way in which we think about these revolutions in our behaviour is that we look at them from a really weird, strange and downright warped perspective. And that's ours. So when we think of something like the Industrial Revolution, it seems like it happened a really long time ago at several lifetimes distance from the present. But once we start to put these tranches of time into the context of our DNA, then their significance starts to shrink to microscopic proportions really very quickly. This is the amount of time that it took for us to start gathering in cities. It happened about 5,000 years ago with the Metropolitan Revolution. But when we double that time to 10,000 years, we get the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago. This meant a big change, a huge change in our food diet, but also in our light nutrition as we began to experiment with things like indoor behaviours, for example. But before that, we were hunting and gathering for about 300,000 years, and that's just our own species family, modern Homo sapiens. And before then, the Homo genus was, gathering, was hunting and gathering for two million years. Now, I'm not going to be talking about solutions today, but none of the solutions that I am interested in in my other work are about um, you know, eating raw meat or drinking water from a stream. It's instead, I'm more interested in cherry-picking from aspects of human behaviour that have worked for us in the past. So bearing in mind now that the Industrial Revolution doesn't even appear as a single dot on this screen... Take a moment to look around you, look around the room. It's a bit awkward looking at other people, I know, trust me. Um, take a moment to look around you now and try to find something, absolutely anything in your eye line that is not from the Industrial Revolution. So the technology that we are using is a really obvious example of the Industrial Revolution, but everything around us, from the carpets, the paint on the walls, it's all uh, been created and transported using industrial processes. So the really keen-eyed amongst you, the really smart ones amongst you will have gone, this is easy, because it's, of course, other humans. So while the clothes that they're wearing, I'm, I assume you're all wearing clothes, I can't quite see you all. While the clothes that they're wearing will, have, will of course, been made and transported using industrial processes and practices, the faces seem very human and very natural, but are they? In the next uh, about eight and a half minutes... I'm going to talk to you, introduce you to the ways in which modern life is changing us from the tips of our toes all the way up to the tops of our heads. And I'm going to focus in particular on those, on those faces. So when we look at our faces in a mirror, we uh, feel that our faces are a really unique part of our identity. They're a unique expression of our DNA. And they are. They're, they're very unique to us. Uh, they're so unique that if you want to unlock your smartphone, your face is 20 times more secure at doing that than even your fingerprint is. But our faces, like the rest of our bodies, are changing because of the, uh, the amount of work that we no longer do. All over the world, humans are experiencing a practically global movement famine. All over the developed world, uh, humans have had their movement taxed from them, taxed heavily from them, because technology is streamlining everything around us, and it's making it more difficult for us to move, and we can't see it because it's omnipresent. It's everywhere, everywhere we look. It's like we are all living in the third drawer down. You've all got this drawer. You open it up, and inside are a load of orphan chargers. There's a load of cables... There's a, there's a mobile phone that you've got in there, probably from about 2002, that you've held on to as backup for some reason. 
and there's probably a poor upturned mouse that's had its batteries disemboweled from it because some remote trumped it in the food chain. And it's like we're all stuck in this drawer, we're all tangled up in its plasticky mess and we can't move. We live so subsumed in an ecology of technology that we can't even see it. It's, you may as well try and point out water to a fish or the air to a skylark. At home, our movement is taxed by simple things that we take for granted, by Robovax, Robovax, uh, dishwashers, washing machines, or, or even doorbells that send video to our phones so we don't even need to get up out of our chair to see who's there. Sedentary work has become incredibly common. It's now the normal thing to do, but it's only arrived in about the last 200 years or so. Uh, before then, it didn't really exist. Uh, if you think back to the 1840s with uh, uh, Bob Cratchit in A Christmas Carol, uh, if you're not sure who that is or if Charles Dickens isn't your thing, then, you know, Kermit from The Muppet Christmas Carol, same thing. You know, Bob Cratchit worked with heavy, heavy ledgers and would have had to have sat on a, on a really hard stool that he would have had to have got up from regularly and walked round because his, his bum would have hurt. But sedentary work today has become much more sedentary. You know, when did you last get out of your chair to retrieve a fax or do some photocopying or even empty your out tray? Everyone under 25 in the room has just gone, what is an out tray? <laughs> <laughs> cars, you know, cars have, have uh, taxed us very heavily, it's taxed us very heavily of our, of our movements. But even driving them has become much, much easier. You know, when was the last time you had to wind up your window? Or when was the last time you drove one that didn't have power-assisted steering? It's like trying to do a, a handbrake turn in a, in a pirate ship. So car driving has become much, much easier. And our bodies are changing because of the amount of work that's been taken away from them. And our heads, our faces and our heads are no different. They're also changing because of the amount of work that we no longer do. So I'm going to come back to what's happening up here in just a moment. But below our eyes, we have the upper jaw and the lower jaw, or the maxilla and the mandible. Both house our, our very own food processors. These are, of course, our, our teeth. About 10,000 years ago, we started experimenting with much, much softer foodstuffs. Uh, cooking became much more common, and grains became a, a mainstay of our diet. It used to be that we had to process things like gritty tubers and, and roots, as well as to you know, chew our way through raw meat. But what's really changed is the sheer amounts of processing that we do to food, and also the volume of processed food that we actually eat. Cooked food is, of course, much easier for us to eat. I'm not down on cooking. Cooking has loads of hygiene and nutritional benefits. It's, you know, it's a, it's a really, really good thing. But what it does mean is that throughout our childhood and, and adolescence, our jaws are so chronically understimulated by our diet that they never get to grow large enough to house our many adult teeth. And the result is that we have to endure painful trips to the dentist. I apologise to any dentists in the audience. But we have to endure really painful trips to the dentist where they either have to straighten out our teeth or, or take out some of our teeth to make room for the others. And if, my friends, your teeth look anything like this, then you need to get to a dentist very, very quickly indeed. So the result is that we end up with crowded and uh, crooked teeth. And you don't really see this in pre-agricultural fossil remains. Instead, they tend to have a very clean, organized dental array. As a result, our faces are much slimmer than they used to be. But also, when you look at the skull from the side, our faces are also much flatter. This doesn't seem like such a big deal. I mean, your face is different, but there's more, believe me. So your face is flatter, but what's also happening is, as if to, to keep our center of gravity, as our faces have flattened out at the front, where the occipital and parietal parts of the skull meet at the back, that has also receded inwards as well. So our, our heads are narrower, our faces are narrower from the front, and our heads are narrower from the side. Now, I'd say, think about the impact of the fact that our skulls are smaller at the back, but you might find it a bit difficult to do this because it means our brains are smaller than they used to be before we turned to processed food diets. So, it's not all about food diet, though. One of the other diets that's changed drastically 
um, in the last 10,000 years, but has really accelerated in the last 100 years, is, of course, our light diet. And the result is it's making it much more difficult for us to, to see. As you looked around the room, some of the faces that you saw looking back at you will have been framed by spectacles to help compensate for a condition called myopia or short-sightedness. People used to think that short-sightedness was really a, uh, a really genetic thing, and it, while there are some genes involved in the, the generation of the condition, they're actually, they're actually very, very weak. There are hundreds of genes, but they're very weak at determining the outcome. For a long time, we've associated it with gadget use and close work, like reading, but now, now it's, it's almost certain that actually it's to do with our, our light diet, the amount of time that we spend outdoors. So I want to tell you about a study a study that was done that assessed the light behaviours and the light nutrition of modern Americans. And at the end of the study, they came up with a number, and the number uh, uh, told us how much time Americans spent, modern Americans spent, away from natural light. It's a really, really shocking number, but actually, it's not that shocking. This isn't even a new trial. This trial was published in one of the world's leading science periodicals, Nature, in 2001. Now, to me, <laughs> people my age, that seems quite recent, but actually it was a long time ago, um, because, you know, the smartphone was only invented in 2007. 2001 is also long before the invention of its partnering smart tablet in 2010. It's before social media completely took over our lives. It's before also the streaming giants accustomed us and acclimatized us to watching TV shows, you know, binging 10 hours or 15 hours all in one go. And sometimes the shows can be 30, 40, or 50 hours in length. So this number, 93%, is 93% before we count any of those things. So modern life is making it much more difficult for us to spend time outdoors. And of course, it has impacts all across the spectrum of human health and of well-being. But one of those is it's making it more difficult for us to see because the human eye, as it develops, and we continue growing until we're about 25 years old, the human eye, as it develops, needs stimulation from daylight so it knows when to stop. To give you some sense of how big a problem this is becoming, this is how many of the younger generation in countries like Singapore are now short-sighted. But this isn't even the, the best statistic. That prize goes to 19-year-old men in the capital of Seoul in South Korea that report levels of short-sightedness at 96.5% or 97% when you round it up. It's currently thought that if nothing is done to curb the onset of myopia, then by 2050, half the world's population will be myopic. Now, if it's not too awkward, <laughs> take a moment to look around you once again and look at those faces looking back at you. They feel just as awkward as you do, I promise you. Look at those, think about those faces looking back at you and think about how modern life has changed those faces, but also how it's changed yours. It's changing all of us all over the world. These are, these are global things. This is a global story that we're dealing with. And if that's the impact, if those are the impacts that it's had on your, on your head, shrinking brain, even a different voice perhaps, uh, a complete change in facial appearance, Try to think about the effects or the impacts that it's having as the effects of modern life ripple and shimmer across the rest of your body, in your feet, in your ankles, in your hips, in your spine, in the width of your elbows, in the strength of your wrists, on your skin, in your lungs, in your heart, and of course, in your, in your brain. But that, friends, that's, a, that's another talk entirely. Thank you very much. <laughs>